very prominent in the physician finance space. And today he's released his most recent book, um, Loving Your Timeshare. I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, we're going to talk all about timeshares, um, why the um, it gets a bad rap, go through some common misconceptions and go through how to best use your timeshare. So uh, I'll welcome Corey to the stage. Corey, welcome. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm familiar with your story. I know you're a, you're a surgeon and you got financially free through real estate and, you know, now you're an active speaker, but give the audience a background of where you came from and we'll go from there. So I uh, grew up in Southern Oregon and both uh, my father, I, and my grandmother, we all graduated from the same high school. And so I actually moved back to Southern Oregon to start uh, my practice in general surgery. And I actually ended up in a school district that was different. And so my kids actually go to a rival school from all the rest of us. So that makes for an interesting time at uh, football season. But I, I wanted to practice medicine since I was a little kid. Um, and, and it became um, the only thing I ever went after. Uh, eventually, uh, I started my practice and uh, practiced for 20 years. But about eight years into that, we were investing just in our, our uh, 401k and IRAs, and I began to invest in real estate as well. And shortly thereafter, we had uh, 64 rental units, and I was managing them as a full-time surgeon. Um, people always wondered how that was even possible. <laughs> and so I ended up writing a book about that, The Doctor's Guide to B uh, Real Estate Investing for Busy Professionals, to yeah. show them how that was possible. It, it actually is a doable thing. Yeah. Um, and then, so 20, 12 years after that, 20 years into my practice, my real estate business uh, was making more money than, than I needed to live on. Um, I wanted to go part-time, but the way our, our practice was set up, it was only for full-time docs. And so part-time wasn't a possibility and, and I had to leave the practice. I practiced three years as a locums doctor and then uh, started this uh, financial success MD business to teach doctors about finance and real estate and, and having a good practice, avoiding burnout, basically kind of how to do medicine right and have a great life. Uh, and then three years after starting that locums business, I decided to, to let go of medicine completely. And today I just spend my time you know, helping raise a grandchild and travel in the world and doing whatever I want. And in a little bit in my spare time, I teach doctors about finance. Yeah, it's a wonderful story. And um, I know you've, um, so you have financial time, location and health freedom. So you, you know, you pretty much hack the code and living the life and teaching doctors how to do it as well. And, you know, you also talked about, um, you've also written books, you know, navigating a financial crisis, uh, smart career alternatives and investment, uh, talking about how to uh, eliminate student loan debt and how to start a practicing career, right? So, um, but, you know, it's particularly interesting is this a new book that you have, it's called Guide to Loving Your Timeshare and How to Get the Most for Your Money and Family Fun and Experiences. So we'll go, I know, you know we'll, go, we'll start um, first is uh, one thing is uh, biggest question, when I before I even got this book, timeshares get a very bad rap. So what? How did how did that happen? And we'll go from there. Well, I think there are two two things that really give it a bad rap. Number one is the pushy salesman who sells them, and number two, the wrong people buy them. And if you're not the right person for a timeshare, let's say for example, you uh, work in a mill, you get two weeks off a year. Um, and you bought this thinking you're going to have these great vacations because the timeshare itself is inexpensive to use, but all of the other things that go with taking that vacation, you can't afford, you know, you, you, let's say you're going to trade your timeshare into Orlando and go to do Disney for a week. Well, four, four airplane tickets for your family and all the food and all the tickets and a car rental, all that stuff's going to probably cost four or $5,000 to do. The timeshare is going to be the smallest of all of your expenses. And yet, because of all those other ones, you can't go. And so then you didn't use your timeshare that year. And then the next year, you didn't use it. 
And then the next year you didn't use it. And every year you pay a maintenance fee to keep that going, kind of like a, a homeowner's um, association fee. And when all is said and done, you're unhappy because you can't seem to use it and it keeps costing you money every year. Kind of like owning a car you, and you don't have a driver's license, but every year you got to pay for licensing and, and fees and insurance. Um, I say you best get your license so you can use the darn thing. And so what happens is these people are unhappy and they go telling everybody about their experience, but they actually never learn to use their timeshare either. And so when you combine people who turned out couldn't afford to vacation like that and people who never learned how to use it in the first place, then you got a lot of people running around saying bad things about timeshares. And I've owned a timeshare for 30 years and loved it, had great times, great vacations. It's inexpensive. And I couldn't believe all this stuff I kept hearing. So finally, I just kind of had enough. I said, you know, somebody's got to tell the truth. And so I wrote the book to, tell, to show you my experience and how to well use your timeshare so that you can actually love it. Yeah, it's uh, quite interesting because I love talking, just looking at opposing viewpoints and I love hearing the positive and the negatives and then that way you can get a balanced view. Even if you, even if I didn't buy a timeshare, it's good to know that people are out there, you know, getting a lot of utility and benefit. Um, so we'll go through, um, you know, who, who is the ideal person to buy a timeshare? Well, um, I think the most important thing is, is you need to regularly vacation in an upscale manner. You have to be somebody who spends four or five thousand dollars a week when you go on a vacation. If 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 your idea of vacationing is going camping uh, a couple miles from your house, you don't you're not going to want a timeshare. So you've got to be that kind of person. You've got to be kind of a do it yourself kind of person because you're going to be booking your own vacations uh, with the timeshares, and you got to have enough time off. If you've only got two weeks of vacation a year and you're going to use one of them to go to your family reunion and another one to visit your mom, when are you going on the timeshare? You know, I took eight to 12 weeks of vacation every year through my career. And because of that, I had plenty of time to use my timeshare. And when you know what you're doing and you know the hacks that I teach you in the book, I, I own one week of timeshare and I traded it last year or this year for so far eight weeks of vacation. And so it, when you can get eight weeks of vacation out of your timeshare and your price didn't go up by doing that, it becomes very economical. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's quite interesting because um, the way I, you know, when I was reading through this book, um, the idea is uh, call it trading up. You, you describe this idea of trading up and um, it's almost kind of like you have this um, utility and you can actually, it's almost like points hacking or travel hacking or you hack credit cards. Um, so it's really interesting how um, getting the most value from your timeshare. I know you have, um, you know, you have a couple um, strategies and tips on how to do that. Um, you, we, we can sort of go broad surface and um, for the listeners that are interested, they can read through the book and look through it. But how do you, what is kind of general advice for getting the most value from your timeshare? Well, if you are somebody who credit card hacks to get free airplane tickets, timeshares are right up your alley. <laughs> I mean, not only are you going to hack your timeshare and end up getting close to free timeshare use, but you're going to have free airplanes to get there too. You know, you're, you're going to have the best of both worlds. Um, but one of the things that a way you can tell when somebody is down, down playing timeshares and they really don't know what they're talking about. One of the things you hear people say is, well, who wants to go back to the same place every year? Well, that isn't a true statement about timeshares. Now, I've owned my timeshare for 30 years, and I've actually never vacationed at that timeshare that I own. Um, that's the most expensive way to use your timeshare. If you use your timeshare to just go there, let's say I've, so I've got my one week, and then I trade, and I say, I want to just go use my one week, and now I'm done. I used it. It's, it's used up for the year, and I got one week of vacation out of my ownership. 
But if I deposit that week into a trading system, and once you own a single week, you are in the club and you can do this trading, everything trades for a different point value. And so I can deposit mine for say, I think I get 66 points when I put it into RCI. Uh, I end up being able to trade for as low as three points for a place to, to go. Now, if, if I traded for all of them at three points, I'm gonna get like 22 weeks of vacation every year out of the one week that I own. Um, that brings the cost of your uh, maintenance fee, which most people complain about, way down because you divided that same maintenance fee over 22 weeks of vacationing. If your maintenance fee was a super high one at $2,200, you just change it to $100 a week uh, is your fee. And so knowing that you can trade these and, and never go to your same uh, vacation, uh, they become super powerful. Now, this the notion of being able to trade for uh, things that are going for less points and trade again, that's fairly new to the timeshare industry. It used to be I could just trade mine straight across for someplace else. And I used that week, but then they put in that new system and I can trade for points. And so that's just incredible. And the only thing I'm paying is a trade fee to do it. Like when we met, we were at a conference and I went to that conference. If I'd have stayed at the conference hotel, I'd have paid $12.50 for five nights at the hotel. Instead, I stayed four miles away at a timeshare and I paid $199 to get that trade to go for seven nights. And I just hopped in an Uber and that, that place where the, the show was, was so big <laughs> that the amount of time it took you to walk from your room all the way to where the conference was, was about the same amount of time as for me to get in the Uber, drive there and be dropped off right where the conference is. So I wasn't put out at all by being four miles away. And I saved a thousand bucks on that one week of vacation. So there, there's a lot of ways uh, to use your timeshare that can be very economical and expand how much you get to vacation. Yeah. Here's some, uh, here's some questions just kind of uh, in general. Um, so you mentioned you, you, have, you, have a, you have a price that you pay for the timeshare, plus you have a maintenance fee. Uh, do, I know some of the listeners, they would be curious as to whether you can sell your timeshare, you know, for a profit, almost like, you know, like a stock or a real estate investment or something. Does it go up in value? You can sell it. Yeah. That's not really what this is all about. Um, a lot of people, I hear that quote a lot. Oh, timeshare, what a terrible investment. Mm -hmm. But I've, I, I teach budgeting and I've never found investments and vacations on the same line in the budget form vacationing and investing are not the same thing. And so this is vacationing. And what you're doing with timeshares is you're joining a club where you can swap around these places to stay. And so you end up with um, a tremendous new value because uh, you're able to use this. So what you're doing is not investing in something that goes up in value, but you're owning something that allows you to vacation in an upscale manner for less cost. Mm. My actual cost. Now, when I bought my timeshare, I wasn't a very savvy timeshare person. Didn't know anything about them. I paid full retail price for it from one of those salesmen at the meeting. All because I thought I could get this $25 gift card. Uh, that was the most expensive $25 I've ever mm. received. So <clears throat> we paid full price. But even paying full price, over the 30 years and making all our trades, our average price cost per week comes to about $600. Mm -hmm. Now, that's about the price of going to a Motel 6 for a week. And instead, I get like a two or three bedroom place with a couple of bathrooms, a kitchen, a living room, dining room. I get to wake up in the morning and the kids are still sleeping in the other room and go out and have some coffee on the deck. And when the kids finally wake up, all of us in our pajamas go in the kitchen and have breakfast. We don't have to get all dressed and then go downtown to some restaurant and then have to uh, wait for the food. We can eat right away just like we do at home. And so I found, especially with little kids, 
that timeshares are so much better than than hotels that every time I go somewhere for an event, like where I met you at FinCon, every time I do that, first I see if I can get a timeshare in there and not a hotel. Because if I can, it's going to be a better place. So mm -hmm. every day, instead of staying at the hotel, I woke up, made my own breakfast in my kitchen, then got the Uber over to the conference. Whereas if I had been in a hotel, I would have been scrambling for how am I going to have breakfast uh, this morning? So uh, I've really loved that. But you, you've just got to throw out the notion that you're investing. This is not a real estate investment. This is getting access to a vacation club to save money and hack out some cool vacations to some very nice places. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's so well said. Um, and um, is there any... Um potential pitfalls, you know, people that are listening, they, they might be interested in you know, getting uh, involved in a timeshare. I know you mentioned certain companies such as RCI, um, you know, mentioned a couple in the book itself, but, um, you know, is, and what do you think are some of the pitfalls when joining with a particular company? So the, the first thing you got to remember is don't buy retail. Don't go to any, never go to a timeshare meeting where they're going to sell you a timeshare. You can buy timeshares on the secondary market. You, you know, the guy I described who couldn't afford to go on these vacations that he thought he would be doing. Uh, he ends up selling his timeshare for almost nothing. That's the timeshare you want to buy. So the first pitfall is, is to avoid going to those sales meetings. And when you get to your timeshare, uh, don't, book a sales meeting because they will offer you some free stuff. Um, and, and if it was really free stuff, they just give it to you, but it's not actually free. You have to go and spend your time to get it. And so I, none of those free things that they offer are ever worth the time of my vacation to go to. Yeah. So you got to get to your room and then unplug your phone because they're going to call you every day to get you to go to these things. So you don't want to go. You already own your timeshare. You don't need another one. So just stay away from the salesman because they're really good at talking you into spending your money. And so you, you want to stay away from them. That, that's a, a really big pitfall. Uh, stay away from those guys. Uh, another one is mistakenly think you have to trade within your own system. Hmm. Uh, like say, so if you bought near me is the world mark system on the West coast. Okay. They own multiple places. But they probably own, I'm going to guess, 20 places, okay? And they won't tell you that there's a great trading system you should be part of because they want you to go to their 20 places. So now, rather than thinking you always have to go to the one you own, you think you have to go to the system you own and you have to just trade in Walmart. And instead of having those 20 places, if you deposit it into a trading company, and there's two big ones, RCI and Interval International, and if you deposit it into there, you have more than 4,000 places to trade to. Wow. And so it's a big pitfall if you fall into the notion that you have to go where you own. You mm -hmm. don't. Um, the last chapter of my book, I interviewed people around the swimming pool at Timeshares <laughs> to hear their, their comments, what they think. And I ran into a lady who we were talking. She says, yeah, I never go to my Timeshare. That's just a waste of money, man. You can get so much better deal by trading it. And I asked her where she owned and she owned in a place in Honolulu, Hawaii. I said, well, I've been to that timeshare. She said, where, where do you own? And I told her I own in New Orleans. She says, well, I've been to that timeshare. So here we were at the pool. We have each been to each other's timeshare and neither one of us have ever stayed in our own. And I, there are with 4,000 places to choose from, don't fall into the pitfall of thinking that, oh, I went to this great timeshare. It was a great place. I want to go back there again. Mm -hmm. There are lots of great places. Almost all of them are great choices, especially if you stick to the Gold Crown and Silver Crown resorts, which are their top great places to be. Why keep going back to the same one just because you're familiar with it? Pick another one. Uh, there are only two resorts we've ever repeated uh, in 30 years. We just keep going to new ones we've never been to and experiencing a completely new thing. And one of them is close to our home. And so we can just drive to that one. And we go there fairly frequently. Um, that one gets repeated. And then there was one in, in uh, Southern California 
uh, in a location we like uh, that we've been to twice. And so other than that, we just keep going all over the place. Um, another pitfall that you really fall into is when people book their vacation, they tend to say something like this. I want to go to a beach in Maui on January 19th. And then they look in the timeshare. Remember, there's only about 4,000 choices and only a few of them are going to be in Maui. There's not nearly as many of them as our hotels. They're just cheaper and better but there's fewer of them. And so you go to look for that and you say, oh, there's nothing available. And now you're disappointed because you didn't get what you wanted. Mm -hmm. But instead you need to be thinking, what is it I want? You want a tropical beach in the winter, right? That's what you were going after. And mm -hmm. you just got so specific that something that doesn't have as much availability is harder to find. Instead, if you would have searched for I want to go to a tropical beach in January or February, you'd have probably had 40, 50, 60 choices of really great places to go to all over the world. Because there are a lot more tropical beaches than just Hawaii. There's Mexico, there's everything in the Caribbean, the French Riviera, the Canary Island. I mean, there's places all over to go. And, and you never go to them because you know of Hawaii and you keep saying, I want to go to Mount. Um, you're going to miss so much if you get stuck in a rut that you've got to go to this one place instead of that you've got, you want to have a particular experience. And so when you do that, now you've got 40 choices. You just click on the one you want to go to and then tell your boss, that's when your week of vacation is going to be this year. And you're off to a tropical beach. Yeah. Well, those are some of the pitfalls. There, there's a bunch of more of them in the book. Um, I don't know if you want me to Go on to that, or maybe we should go to a different topic. Yeah. Well, no, what's interesting is um, because uh, you have a chapter talking about how to buy timeshare at the bargain price. And what's interesting is you have this um, table of inflation of various goods since uh, from 92 all the way to pre-COVID. And uh, what's interesting is you have, um, you know, the maintenance fees, of course, and you know, of course, those go up every so often and, and then you compare it to uh, gas milk uh, car house and then uh, what's interesting is the uh, the dow jones and the federal debt and you know the federal debt inflation ratio is like astronomical the dow jones and then you know the maintenance fees because everybody complains about maintenance fees being too high but it's actually one of the lower when you compare it to you know gas or mm -hmm. milk or groceries so but, and imagine if you owned a vacation home, okay? Yeah. And so you owned a vacation home someplace. Now you have to pay taxes, you have to pay insurance, you have to pay maintenance fees to take care of the yard and fix stuff there. And you know, every year, I've owned my timeshare for 30 years. Over that 30 year span, I would be super surprised if those things didn't go up in price. Mm -hmm. So you would expect that the maintenance of anything you own is going to cost more every year. Uh, that's just the way it works. And so what determines how high your maintenance fee is, is how high the cost of living is in the area where you own. So if you own something in downtown San Francisco, which is a high cost of living, their maintenance fees will be high. It takes more money to maintain that place. If you own a place in um, the Midwest, their maintenance fees are going to be low. So if you can trade this stuff anyway, don't pick one with a high maintenance fee. <laughs> Get one with a low maintenance fee and trade that one. Uh, because the trade's going to work out the same no matter what your maintenance fees are. Yeah. But you would expect that. I mean, if you owned, let's say you owned a vacation home and you owned it with five people, uh, you're all going to split the costs of taking care of that place and the couch wears out you get a new couch you each buy one fifth of the new couch i mean that's exactly how you would have done it if you had a vacation home and that's exactly the way the timeshare does it splits up all those costs amongst all the owners and it turns out to be a whole lot cheaper than if you had to own your own vacation place um, because you're sharing this cost with lots of people yeah yeah so it's been a fascinating discussion and um you know, I encourage all the listeners to check out uh, Dr. Fawcett's book. It's probably on Amazon. It's called uh, Loving Your Timeshare. I got my copy and it's really fascinating. Just uh, it's almost 
considered travel hacking and is basically utility mm -hmm. and finding different ways to hack the system. So, and if you can get things for cheaper, why not? Um, so how can people find you, contact you? I know you're a coach as well and speaker. Um, so tell everybody how they can connect with you. Um, the best place to connect with me is through my website, Financial Success MD, uh, at financialsuccessmd.com. Uh, if you need to email me, you have some questions about something, I am MD at financialsuccessmd.com. And using that same name or my own name, you can find me on Twitter and Pinterest and Instagram and LinkedIn and YouTube. <laughs> and they, it's all over the place. Basically, if you just Google my name, you'll get about three pages of things to do. Um, but mainly come to my web page and, and you'll find a blog coming out uh, at once a week and a new story. Sometimes they're about timeshare. Sometimes they're about other things that make your life better. But I'd love to hear from you. And if you have any questions is that after you read my book, feel free to contact me. Yeah. And for all the listeners out there, um, Dr. Fawcett's links or resources will be in the links and show notes. And uh, we look forward to um, having you as on as a future guest and hearing about your future success. Thanks. Thanks for having me.